So, um, kind of getting my brain rearranged here a little bit. It may take a minute or two. Everything's been about construction, which we'll have a chance to kind of talk about at the end. But we've really got two parts um, for tonight. Um, the first session is really a work session. Um, it's designed to get folks together brainstorming a little bit about the things the district can do um, to kind of give us a plan that we can implement to get the community hopefully to grow a little bit, um, but also to provide a little bit of comfort. It's kind of a follow-up to the last uh, open forum that we had. Um, and there were a couple of truths that came out of that, that forum, which I think will be good to review in a moment or two. Um, the second part is a question and answer session. Um, there is a lot going on, as you know, across the district right now. Um, and so this is an opportunity for folks to ask me specific questions and, and hear kind of the district responses and hopefully feel a little bit better about the work that's going on. It's been very difficult, um, especially with the heating issue uh, because we're working with so many different groups of contractors and folks. You know, we like to try to get information out as fast as possible, but we also like to make sure that we've got the best information. Um, when we get it out to the community. So I'll have an opportunity to talk about that a little bit. All right, so let's hit rewind a little bit um, and kind of step back about a month ago uh, when we had the open forum um, that was spurred because of the locker room issue um, that came up in the WCAX News uh, art article or the, the um, report that came out. Um, and I think it's really important to try to set the idea with folks that these issues that we are dealing with are very complex. And they're very complex um, in terms of the school have to, having to manage them. And I'll kind of try to see if I can explain this in a way that, that, that is understandable. Um, probably the best example um, to try to explain this complexity um, is if we imagine that we've got a social studies teacher, math teacher, a science teacher, um, who refuses to use uh, a transgender student's pronouns or preferred name. Two things can happen in this scenario. The teacher can claim that they are exercising their free speech rights, and at the same time, the student can claim that they are being discriminated against. Both statements hold weight, and the rights of each individual in this matter is equal under the law. Given this ambiguity, it's very difficult for the district to decide what it should do. Free speech, freedom from being, discrimination, being discriminated against. They are both equal in the eyes of the law. Our lives would be a heck of a lot easier if the law said, okay, this one is up here a little bit, right? Because then it's easy for us to make a decision. Or this one's up here, so you know where you have to put your preferences at. But that's not what's going on here. And we've had three or four situations this year that we've been put in exactly this same boat. This is really a matter uh, for the courts to decide. And the reason that I say that, is because there's no clarity, right? They've got these laws there, um, they're in conflict with each other, and they have not provided us with any kind of clarity so that we can make better decisions. The information that they need to provide us is actually pretty simple, and it's this idea of when does free speech become less about exercising one's freedom and more about removing a person's right to be free from discrimination. Regardless of how long we have to wait to receive that answer, to receive that clarity, we're all here because we've got to find a way to work together for the greater good of our students. In Vermont, the state has provided guidelines that we have to follow, and those guidelines are untested by law. But the schools are required to follow them nonetheless. But it's not clear. So that's why we are in the situation that we're in right now. At the last uh, time that we met, we had an open forum, and we kind of established that there are two truths out there. Um, that, that came out very clearly as people spoke. And you've got on the one hand, you've got um, people that simply are not comfortable sharing locker rooms and bathrooms. Understandable. On the other hand, um, we've got LGBTQ folks who do have the right to be treated like everyone else. And again, you see that conflict. So our goal tonight, hopefully, is to develop the foundation of a plan that will provide comfort for all without violating 
the conflicting laws that the district is required to uphold. And so that's why I've got you broken into work sessions, um, little work groups, little focus groups. And this work will not be easy because these are tough questions. Um, but my hope is, is that we're going to get some really good feedback, some really good ideas that we can kind of run with. Um, so we're going to be doing some brainstorming. You're going to be brainstorming at your tables. Um, and what we're really focused on um, is ways that we can honor both of those truths while trying to maximize everybody's comfort. And the things that we're going to talk a little bit about and that I'm going to try to elicit some ideas from you on um, is what can we do in terms of education and programming? What can we do in terms of structures? And what can we do in terms of addressing what I'm calling community tribalism? At the end of this discussion, um, what's going to happen is we'll go around, we're going to collect the papers, I'll collate all the information, um, and we'll put a plan together that's going to be run past the cabinet, and is also going to be run past the legal team, right? Because like I said, those laws are, are pretty explicit, but they conflict with each other, so we're going to need their advice on what we should implement or what we can implement and what we shouldn't. And then I'll be good about communicating back out to the community where we're headed. Um, we've got you into groups by, by table. As I said a little bit earlier, we need one brave person who wants to be the recorder. Um, there are three topics that we're going to be brainstorming on. Therefore, you're going to probably need three sheets of paper. Um, and then, like I said at the end, I'm going to collect that information. So, first round here. This is ideas about education and programming. Recorder is what I want you to do. First, first step here, please label your first sheet as education and programming. And then I'll give you some ideas about, uh, and maybe an example or two that, that might fit this to get you started on the brainstorming session. So the, the basic question that folks are trying to answer trying to generate some ideas around is what can we do educationally to build a stronger unity amongst all our students within the school? We are a school district after all, and so our primary mission is education. So this is an important question. You know, what programs, what classes, what conferences, what trainings should we consider that might help ease the tensions that now exist? A perfect example, um, best one I could think of off the fly was uh, an opening day training for students on where to find private spaces in each building. Okay. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. And you've got to talk with your group, you've got to get some conversations going. So I'm going to shut up for a little while and give you about five minutes. I'll wander around and check in with the tables if there's questions. Yeah. And we can kind of focus on the next piece of our agenda here. Um, and I'll give you a warning. The third thing that I'm going to ask you to brainstorm about is going to be the hardest. So part of this is getting you worked up to the big stuff. So the next idea that I want you to work on in your groups is this idea of structures. Um, and structures are basically just anything that creates order within an organization. Um, lots of times they're physical in nature, um, right? Examples uh, of physical structures that might help uh, us make fe people feel a little bit more comfortable and, and move the district forward, right? Private stalls and locker rooms, um, posters hung on the walls that show where private spaces can be found, right? Physical structures, things you can actually put your hands on. But structures, again, things that provide order to an organization can also be a little bit more abstract. They're policies and protocols and procedures. And again, I'm throwing these examples out because they were what I could brainstorm on the fly very quickly. Um, doesn't mean that, that they need to be included. But as an example of a protocol, students who are uncomfortable using shared bathrooms and locker rooms will be magnanimous enough to seek out a private space to use. So does that make a little bit of sense in terms of structures? So either on a separate sheet of paper, or you can draw two lines. You're going to put the heading on there. This is educational structures. 
and do a little bit of brainstorming. Remember, they can be physical, they can be policies, they can be procedures. All right, there's some good conversations going on, which we need and we appreciate. The, one of the most important things about tonight for everybody is exactly what is happening right now, is people sitting down having conversations with one another, right? And this is something that we're going to need to do a lot more of um, as we try to progress through the work that we've got to do. So take another couple of moments to kind of get settled in. And then you've got the biggest challenge ahead of you with the next piece I'm going to ask you to brainstorm on. Now, the assertions I'm going to make are based upon what I've noticed, what I've experienced in my time here, um, because it's not the first time that we've wrestled with controversy. Uh, and so... What I want folks to try to grapple with a little bit, and again, this is incredibly difficult, um, and it's a little bit outside the bailiwick of the, of the schools to, to manage, but given where we're at and where we want to go, um, the only way we're going to get there is if we try to address these community issues a little bit, um, working together um, to affect that change. For me, the simple fact is that the root cause of a lot of the climate issues within the schools are primarily caused by what I'm calling tribalism. And so I want to give that a definition. Um, those are behaviors that stem from a strong loyalty to one's own tribe or social group. And that tribalism does exist within the community. And I want to be absolutely clear so nobody misses this point. That tribalism exists on both sides of the spectrum. Right? whether it be political, religious, or social. The problem is, is when you get those two sides that are very far apart, it's like acid and water, right? It's an explosive mixture. It needs to be diffused because otherwise it will destroy us all, which is a little bit of, of what we're experiencing right now. So this is the toughest question I'm going to ask you to wrestle with tonight. How do we bring the community together while respecting individuals' beliefs? If we can't accomplish this, this district will not grow and it will not flourish. So this is the most important question of the night. In this one, you know, I'm going to give a couple of examples. They're not meant to guide your thinking, just to give you some ideas that I was able to pull um, from some folks that I spoke with today. You know, one of the examples of how we bring the community together is defining a common mission that all sides agree to pursue with the understanding that that means everyone is going to give up a little bit of what they want for the greater good. Not one side is giving up some of what they want. Both sides have to give up a little bit. That's what collaboration is all about. Coming together more often with trained facilitators to help the community break down the silos that exist. And the most important one of all, um, taken directly from the literature, challenging and rejecting community leaders who may be throwing fuel on the fire instead of seeking collaboration. So those are the examples that I was able to come up with in terms of brainstorming. So this is a, a tough conversation, so we'll, we'll give it a bit more time. But again, how can we affect change in our community to get people working closer together so that it's not spilling over into our schools? I'm going to ask folks to do a couple of things. Actually, I'm going to have the two of you help a little bit as well. Um, try to wrap up final thoughts. 
give a, a quick look at what you've written. It, from what I can see, people have actually been pretty clear, so that's awesome. Um, but if anything doesn't quite say exactly what your group meant to say, please clarify that a little bit. And then a few folks are going to come around and they are going to grab the documents and the materials. And then we can kind of move on to question and answer after we talk about next steps. And people were actually asking some good questions about the, you know, getting the students involved in a similar process, which I think is very important. But we're kind of, we're kind of in an odd place within the district right now and kind of responding to everything that's happened in the last month or two. We've had a lot of, a lot of harm that has happened um, to the staff, uh, to the students through the voicemails, through the emails. Um, and so Heather Lawler <laughs> has been instrumental in pulling folks together and creating affinity groups um, for folks to have those discussions about where they're at, what, what they're feeling, um, what they need to feel comfortable kind of moving forward. So this will be brought back to the students at, at some point in time, but right now the concern is for that comfort um, level as well as the staff. So the basic process for next steps with this is we're going to, take all the wonderful ideas, and I do appreciate so much the work that folks did tonight. Bring them back in front of the cabinet and in front of the equity coordinator to review. They'll determine, um, you know, how we're going to pull the other constituents into the conversation. We'll get all that gathered together. We'll summarize it. We'll send it off to a legal review to see which things we can do without violating any of the various and complex laws that we all have to navigate. And then we'll put out an implementation plan to the community and start work on this. Um, and so this is, this is vitally important, and I do thank you. I do want to move over now um, to give an opportunity with everything that's going on for kind of questions and answers. Um, so this is the opportunity. Usually with me with Open Forum, all things are on the table to talk about. Somebody's got to be brave to go first. Yeah. Uh, there's talk about renovations in the high school locker rooms. Will this also carry down to the middle school locker rooms as well? Yeah, so the, the plan actually started on the 27th of September, um, having the discussions, getting facilities kind of coordinated um, to get the contractors in to do the work. Um, the problem is we didn't know what the cost was going to be. And it takes a while right now, post-COVID, to get contractors that are so busy to, to kind of show up. Um, it ended up being under uh, a $40,000 repair, so we didn't have to go out to bid on it. Um, it's 34,000 right now, and that is for all four locker rooms. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, hopefully that work is starting in early December. Right now. It's a good question. Other questions? We thought that if you involved the community in that rebuild, um, maybe under with a contractor supervision, that could bring the two groups together for the good of of what everybody wants. Might, company. might be able to get you together to help us rebuild the heat system. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea on that. <laughs> but no, um, it's, it's not a bad idea. Um, this is, we're just trying to fast track it. Okay. We're trying to fast track it in, slow, in, in a slow time. Right now, it's, it, like I said, it's hard to get the contractors out. So I heard from one person, and I don't want to put all on a stack in it, yep. but that while the heat is out and the school is closed, that there's not going to be any kind of distance learning kinds of scenarios, and it was because of somebody at the state level that said we can't do that. And that seems to me somebody ought to be on the stick on that. Yeah, so I, um, actually, I, and I can try to give you some potential good news tonight. Um, so remind me not to forget about that. So um, one of the first things that, because it was the most logical when this all happened, it was like, oh, you know, we just got done, you know, the teachers did an exceptional job pulling together, getting the kids in the remote during COVID. Um, we still are using most of the same software. You know, every kid's got a Chromebook. This should be an easy thing to do. Uh, the problem was, as I understand it, because I did reach out to the Secretary of Education, give him a lot of credit, he got right back to us. Um, was that the provision to allow for remote session 
was a legislative act that happened in response to the COVID emergency. So when the uh, state of emergency was concluded, that provision went away. And so it is not acceptable for us to go to a remote session. It will not count as days towards learning. And that was when we first started um, way back uh, March of 2019 or whenever it was. Um, that was kind of the, the rule of the land then too. They wanted us to get all the kids and all the, the teachers out of the schools as quickly as possible, but those days didn't really count towards learning, um, even though they wanted us to try to keep the kids you going. You can't get Larry to get on Jay's case in the department of the health the It's my understanding, as limited as it is, so don't take it as gospel, but my understanding um, with, with what came back to me was it would take a legislative action. The, the law would have to change to allow this, like in an emergency situation, for this to, you know, be viable. So it is something that, you know, you're going to hear probably from the superintendents. And it's probably going to be a bigger issue um, because we've got the PCB testing. And so you're going to get um, schools that are going to get their results back and the next day have to shut down. Right? And so it, it, it's worthy of, of coming up under the legislative session. Just to, so, so talk to Jay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, because he's not, he's usually on the edge. Um, but the the good news, and again, I don't I don't want to get hopes up um, too much, but there is uh, some real potential here. What's really miserable about the situation that we find ourselves in with the heat is that currently the repair time it's just long enough that we got to do something about it about getting kids learning. It's short enough that what we have to do to move all the students around and move all the furniture around between you know three different locations, um, it almost doesn't make it worthwhile. Right? You know, it'd be one thing if the heat was going to be down for the remainder of the year and we had to use the new locations. Um, we have been scouring literally the planet um, for the parts that we need. Um, there is a group out of Virgens, a, a contracting group who believes that they have what we need not in, in a higher grade of material than we need, which is fine, we'll pay the extra money for it, but it is possible that we could get the students back on December 5th. Oh. Everything repaired and up. Wow. It's not guaranteed, it could change, but that's the indication that we have today. If that is the case, here is the tough part, is that it's gonna take a week or two to move everything and everybody around to all these other locations. Um, it means an extra week out of school. Um, but, but that that's much better than what I was hearing that suggested two months without school. Well, two 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 months um, in different locations, but those moves they are not ideal. It's splitting the kids up amongst two or three different locations, not great for safety. Some of the locations are very far away, like Chelsea Middle School, um, but it's all we've got in this area to use. So, um, but they also do not have the equipment or the desks or the chairs. So we have that huge logistical nightmare in a short amount of time. Does VTC have well. any empty rooms? I mean, they, were they, to they do. Out. So Little Red Schoolhouse would, say, would take a grade or two. Um, they have open classroom spaces. Uh, actually, they're not classroom spaces. They're just open spaces. And again, we have to move all our equipment there um, to be able to use those spaces. Furniture and dividers. Uh, yep. Um, so like, with, if things are like moved to different locations, I don't know if you're able to answer this, but like how would classes work where, because I know a lot of classes are mixed with grade levels, so like mm -hmm. if juniors and seniors are at ETC, but 10th graders are like in Chelsea, I know like the grand majority of my classes I have were like at least a few 10th graders, even 9th graders. Yeah. Like how would that be? So, so while we can't do remote session for the full day, some things can be done by a remote session. So if you're the teacher that you normally have your class with is at a different location, that's a time that you might connect remotely. And because you're at school doing it, that kind of covers us under the, under the rules of the rules. So good question. Yeah. In light of the um, immediate um, need regarding the physical infrastructure of the school, the renovation of We need new buildings. <laughs> <laughs> you saw oh, yeah, saw <laughs> can, can, um, could you give us an honest sense of your view on whether that's 
you know, in our future? Ariel? Yeah, it's, uh, we actually, we talked about it. We had 30 people at the meeting. It was all thumbs up. And of course, people don't know what the bill might be, right? Because um, it would have to go out the bid. This is another legislative piece. Um, last year, uh, especially, I think it probably came out of the TCB discussions. Um, the legislator, legislature asked for a study group to go out and take a look at the facilities across the state. Um, given the fact that they haven't provided uh, matching funds for schools to renovate or replace if they needed to for a long time, and just try to get an estimate of what it would cost. Um, so the hope is, is that that study comes back this year, the legislator moves, legislature moves on it, puts some money aside, and if it is, we're top of the list, right? We were in the paper because we've got the building that is uh, the closest <laughs> to the end of its useful life as any other building out there. Now. We do and have maintained it as best we can, um, but these water leaks and things, I mean, it's three times a year we get a main that bursts inside a wall and shuts us down for a couple days, and the cost of, of repairing that, and we've got this piece with the boiler. I mean, these are, these are major systems that are, are literally failing. And if the, the corrosion, the internal kind of corroding away of the pipes that happen in that main line, it's probably also been happening in all the lines through all of the buildings, right? Mm -hmm. So it is, I mean, the, there's two, I don't remember the years that they were built, um, but there was the main building that was probably built about 1950, and then the add-on, I believe, which was the middle school area and the middle school um, field house. I think that was in like 60-something. I think Joe told me 68. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, the, the, these are old facilities. Um, they, they do need some renovations um, or replacement. You know, the, the, the pipe dream um, that I talked about, um, which is possible, um, is that we build the new school, RTCC, um, to separate the buildings from each other, um, but we build the new complex out on the athletic fields. And then that way we can continue to use the current building while that building, while the new construction is happening, we move the kids over, we demolish the old building, and then we build the athletic fields out front. And if we're going to be spending 150 or 200 million, you know, why not spend an extra million and put in a turf field with lights and become the, because we're at the center of the state, um, set it up and charge folks to use us for all their tournaments because we're the most convenient place for everybody in the state. We get a name for that with our athletic teams. So there's there's a lot of yeah, very up, Tori. <laughs> yeah. So so they, they, there there is a vision. Um, I am not going to invest too much time in it, um, given everything else that's going on right now, until we find out what the legislature decides this year. Um, I was hoping because we were scheduled to have our PCB testing done in October. I was hoping that we were actually going to have that testing done because that might have helped push things along a little bit because the age of uh, Brookfield and the age of the high school and the tech center is such that it's possible that you know, we're going to get some hits. And so that would put some impetus to, to really kind of force this issue and, and get some changes to happen. I'm sorry if you said this, I just didn't hear it. No. Where, where, where in the legislative process, is it just an idea or is there some actual traction with this, this so the as, as folks that have been around a lot longer than me know, um, typically what the legislature does is if it's looking at a potential big spending, um, what they do is they say, let's put a study group together. Yeah. So they did that last year. So the study group, my understanding is they're supposed to be reporting out, it's usually in December that they would report out. And then they have that information available to them to try to start making some decisions. It's, okay, do we want to put together a school building fund so that you know we can partially match um, the, partially match the fundings that districts are going to spend if they do some renovations and do some rebuilds? So we're kind of waiting on it. So hopefully it's this year. Give me you, can, you can correct me if I'm hitting sounds hard. Right, that sounds right to me. Yeah. Give me a basic comparison. What's the status on this school? How much did it cost? We're 20 years or so into. Uh, I have no idea. I know. I know that replacing the roof, replacing the roof and the equipment on the roof was 850,000 or so that we did. That was during my time. But this is this is 25 years old now. Yeah. Yeah. The roof. The roof. <laughs> now the, the roofs are usually good for about 20 years, so, um, so we always have to put money. That's one of the things that we do with the reserve funds. We put the money aside for the roof to replace it. 
kind of other questions. Yeah. I just want to say I'm really happy with what I'm hearing about food, the food service. I'll tell Sarah. Thank you. Oh, I've told her as well. She's a, yeah, she, but she's Heather and Sarah have been working really hard on uh, making sure that the food that we have in storage right now isn't going away. So they've been mm -hmm. been, yeah. been doing some work with the community to make sure that it's at the place. And how will food work? Are we used to have bag lunches for the duration, or it'll be similar to COVID. Um, the bus drivers that were really good, um, so they'll they'll put together lunches, uh, hot or cold, um, and deliver them to the locations if we need to. Great. Yeah, the the logistics of having to do this for six weeks is it almost like I said, and then the cost. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm hoping they get that December 5th. And you know, people will be a little bit upset about the kids being out of school another week, I get that. Um, but boy, there is something to be said in terms of maintaining learning and, and students being comfortable if they're just used to the same routines and consistency that they've always had. Because this is a tremendous uprooting. Um, there won't be a heck of a lot of learning going on if, if we make these moves just because the routines are broken, the consistency is broken. Uh, so it's again, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one because like I said, it's, it's long enough we gotta do something short enough. How much we can do is pretty limited. Yeah. So this is more of a comment about one of the slides you showed at the beginning of the the forum, um, which said that free speech and discrimination were equal under the law. And I think some cases have come out, and I'm going to actually hand this to you so you can give it to Pietro when we're done here today. Uh, there's two, Meriwether versus Hardtop, which was from last year, which basically said that free speech and religious freedom trump the ability of someone to compel a teacher to use their desired pronoun. It depends on the state, and well, this, this I, I, a, I appreciate the comments, but that's zero, for the lawyers and the... It's a 3-0 ruling from the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. It's federal court. Yeah. And now there's just this month another case, which is Nice versus Becerra, who happens to be the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And this case says that uh, it basically did a comparison between Title VII and Title IX. Title VII is the... Employers Discrimination Act. And that act does say that you can't discriminate based on sexual orientation or gender identity when hiring people. But Title IX, they ruled very clearly, has to do with biological sex. And they said that clearly applies to sporting events in schools. So I, I don't think they're equal anymore now that the federal courts have been ruling when, on When it hits the Supreme Court, we'll know. That is true, but <laughs> the, the federal lower courts are leaning towards it And depending upon which federal lower court you go to, you would get a different ruling. Um, that's typically what happens in the U.S. Yeah. It that's is, why they try to gear which, which place they're going to be heard at when it, they're... It is, except these two are the only ones out there right now. Yeah. And both of them lean, lean towards when it comes to school sports, which I would assume would apply to school locker rooms and bathrooms, are ruled under Title IX, which was designed to protect women's and girls' rights. But again, John, we, having this conversation isn't going to work. Neither one of us are lawyers or the court. That's why it's I'll actually this for you, and you can give it to the lawyer, it, and you can have him look at it's it. It's actually it's actually a good thing if things are going to court because that's the appropriate place for folks to work these things out it is. and to get the answers. So let's let them do their job. So I appreciate it. Other questions, other thoughts. I just have one other thought. Yes. Yeah. And I'm thinking that it's not possible, but it seems logical to me. Do you have a school here? Um, the elementary school would go on as you, before, if the heating system is failed for longer than you like, yep. um, the elementary would go the day um, time and the high school kids would come in at 2.30 and go to 8 or 9 and get their day in and, um, and we not be so disrupted. We had talked about that. Um, one of the big issues that kind of came up is that a lot of our teachers have young students and they won't be able to have daycare to be able to attend to those, those duties. 
Um, we also had talked about, you know, trying to share space or do kind of split days during the days. You know, as long as the kids are here a half a day, it counts as a full with the AOE. But the problem is, you know, we also want to make sure the kids are performing so we lose out on the learning piece. And the last thing that we want to do um, is we kind of talked a little bit about this idea that routines and consistency are really important. Um, and with the high school, sounds like I triggered the Google, but um, with uh, the high school students, unfortunately, things are already disrupted for them. We also don't want to disrupt the elementaries that, you know, they, they're in a good spot right now because they've got those routines, they've got that, that consistent environment right now. So we can at least leave them alone and not, not spread out our dysfunction, hopefully, right now. So yeah, no, really good, really good thoughts, uh, but we've, we've been picking away at them as well. Yeah, other? Just, oops, sorry, don't lose your thought. Um, just like logistically splitting the, the classes or the, the school between three locations, do you guys have any idea how you're gonna like, account for classes that have uh, multiple grade levels within the class? And also, have you figured out like how the buses are gonna work out? Yeah, uh, Dan, Dan, our transportation director, we were talking with him about today about the possibilities, um, and so he's taken a, a pretty close look at it. The the one issue, big issue that comes out of the transportation piece is Chelsea, because it's a long distance, um, and so those students would probably be ending their day around 1:30 to get them back um, in this district in time to do the other things. That they need. Music. The hope is that the extracurriculars and stuff are getting spread around in smaller, smaller schools so that they have access to that. Um, the multi-grade piece, um, if the teachers are in the same location, um, should not be a problem. Um, if, as we talked about a little bit earlier, um, if there are teachers that, you know, if the student, students have multiple teachers, but if one of their teachers is not in the same location, that's an instance we where for the 40, 40 minutes or 50 minutes or 60 minutes we can do remote instruction. Yeah. Right? The kids can pull out the Chromebooks, do it for that time, and then kind of go back and interact with the teacher there. So I'm not sure if I hit the exact question. Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah. yeah. So good, good questions. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. So this includes a little out of the box thing that maybe should be thrown out, but I'll just yeah. put that as a disclaimer. But you mentioned reference to VTC as a potential spot with little red, the old red schoolhouse. But they also had had a whole dorm that they were using with different people and um, the people from the Randolph house as a housing area. And I don't know what's going on yep. in that site, but that one seemed big enough that it ought to be able to include a huge chunk of it. Yeah, I'm not sure who is still there um, at this point in time. We are going up to do a walkthrough on Monday with them. Um, and they have been uh, incredible. Um, White River Valley has been incredible too about the potential use of Chelsea. We also asked about Rochester High School, which is sitting vacant. Um, it was it was funny for for Jamie, the superintendent over there. Um, his comment was basically, "Yeah, they had their own heating issues, but that was one of the reasons we shut the building down. And then you'd have to do some major construction to really use it right now." Um, and this one is the really out of the box one. Well, there's Brooke. The farm. I didn't close the goat farm. Don't know. I can put it down on the list though. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a huge space again a whole street for the uh oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's what's the name of it? Yeah. Walt Goldfinger. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 That um, there was also over Leo Conley's um, space there, and there was also the building where Adult Basic Ed is. Um, so those are some spaces that we were looking into. Um, part of the problem is that um, we need again because it's such a short time frame, um, we need uh, places that are pretty much just move in. You know, it'd be even better if they had had the furniture there, so that we didn't have to drag all the equipment and the furniture around. Uh, but I'll, I've got the ideas written down that, it, that people are generating. You mentioned that uh, just logistics for games being back and forth in places. That's the community. I think people would love it. We, we had to chat there with teachers' kids. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a, it's a good piece that the uh, one part that we worry a little bit about um, is that like if we use a moving company, 
Um, everything's insured, so if something gets broken or damaged. I mean, a lot of it is moving the technology around as well. Um, so it's nice to know if something gets dropped or bumped or banged, um, you know, we've got a replacement coming in, in its way that won't come out of pocket. Um, again, I'm, I'm banking on December 5th. Right now. Is the part complicated? What's that? Is it like a mechanism with moving machinery and circuitry? Sort of thing it's, it get. is it is literally um, about 20, 25 years ago, they put in a wood boiler. Uh, they got a grant. It was a specialty company that is now out of business. And when they put that, that wood unit in there to, to provide heat, it uses wood chips to provide heat to, uh, to the schools. They moved all the boilers out of the high school into the building with it to combine the heating system. Mm -hmm. And so the, the piece that's the problem is it's a specialized uh, pipe with connectors that comes out of the bottom of the boiler, it goes down into the ground, goes across the parking lot, and it literally comes up in the automotive shop. Um, that pipe is completely corroded and, and defunct at this point in time. Um, but it's a special size that's not normally made, right? It was a proprietary system that came in, they created all their own parts and pieces for it. And so the problem has been is, is that, yeah, we can get the pieces, but somebody literally has to manufacture it before, you know, it's not something we can, yeah, it's not something we can pull off the shelf. So we've been, we've been asking local folks and, and whatnot. Like I said, we've, we found a group that has um, some stainless steel um, piping and connectors that look like they're going to do the job. I'm sorry, did you talk to Ryan Kaplan? Uh, I'd have to check with our facilities folks who, who they have. Uh, he has a very high tech machine shop. Yep. And he's he's there's a the tech on here. He's, I've worked with him. He can build things yep. you wouldn't think people could build. Yeah. No, there's a, there's a couple of folks in and around uh, Vermont, Vermont Tech as well that we have spoken to to try to get that machine. Yes. So, yeah. So good points. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the after school extracurriculars. Uh, during this time is just trying to find other spaces for them. I mean, we do have the three elementaries in the afternoon. Uh, Randolph Elementary is a little problematic because they've got a thriving after-school program um, here that doesn't get over until 5.30. So it just might need some later times if they use this space here. Um, but there is, is the plan to try to relocate. As a matter of fact, we were talking about robotics a little bit earlier um, about finding a, a new space for them. Kim, yeah. what about in any of the churches at the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, we, we had an inquiry, um, so yep. we've given information, but again, that's, you know, that would... Yeah, the fire department's, you know, offering the space. Yeah. It looks like wrestling's going to be happening over at the fire department. And, yeah, so they, um, I got to give credit to Nick, our, our athletic director. Um, he's been connecting with uh, the local schools. Um, the gym at Bethel um, is primarily unused, and so they're allowing us to use that to hopefully get the basketball season up and running. And yeah, people have been really good. Um, if, 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 if space is available, people have, have been good. It's just that the spaces that are available aren't you know, quite, quite suited, so there's a lot of work that happens to the job. If seventh and eighth graders end up at Chelsea, is there going to be a bus route that takes them there? Yeah. Oh yeah, no. We'll be we'll be busing all the students. We're also talking about you know we, we've got to find a way to kind of split up the nurses so we've got a nurse at each of the locations as well. So that was the big discussion that was going on earlier. Chelsea has their own nurse. Yeah, and so one of the things that we might do with uh, at, at Chelsea there is you know see if we can you know pay them a little bit to be able to have access to. Yeah, I hope to so. Her own. Yeah. Other questions on. I've heard rumors that there's going to be no recreation sports for the younger kids. Would you be able to touch on that? Uh, the biggest problem with the rec sports, um, it will happen, uh, but it may be problematic, especially now, was that there's a requirement to have custodial staff there, and we haven't had custodial staff. We've been having a very hard time retaining them. Um, we did try to seek out to, to see if we could uh, you know, contract out for these folks. There's a couple of contracting outfits out there. It would violate the agreement with the union to be able to do that. Um, so we did have a meeting, uh, had a, a bunch of, of folks come in, which was great. It was a good conversation. Um, and so what we ended up coming up with in the interim um, is two things. Um, one is 
there have reached out to see if there are some parents that are willing to just sign up to be custodians under our contract um, for two or three hours a night here and there to be able to cover those events. And so I think we've had four people so far that have showed up to do that, which is awesome um, to have, have the community step up to that. Um, as part of the negotiation process with the, the support staff union, um, we did uh, put some information in their hands at the last uh, session about potentially doing a side agreement that, hey, we're, we're considering raising the starting salaries considerably. How about at least for the custodial staff, um, you, you let us start that now if we can find the, the funding for it. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two things that are happening. But yeah, it, it is a priority. Um, and I think the, um, the addition of, of the, the, the three or four folks that are signing up going to make it happen. But in terms of the specifics of who's going to be what and where, that's going to be a Nick thing. Um, um, no, I just wanted to hear yeah. that it's happening. So yeah. It's, it's oh, yeah. No, it, it's, it's a priority. Is there a requirement that it keep the same um, phys ed type uh, curriculum, or might it include bowling, or might it include the, um, the climbing wall and things like that line? Which piece, which piece are we talking about? The, what he is. Uh, he's not, uh, the, the rec program um, is usually a feeder program for our sports. Um, uh, it's, it's run by the town. Um, it's basketball. It's, 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 it's the same sort of sports that we usually do in high school. Yeah. What, what do you do with like arts, music, theater, other specials that serve all the grade levels? Yeah, it's, uh, a lot of that potentially would be remote, yeah. which is difficult. Uh, the focus, if we go to um, the separate locations, the primary focus has got to be on the core. Right. And then we fill in the, the others as best we can around. Um, everybody will be working full time, but it just, sure, it, sure. It, it, it may be in different modalities. Yeah, I wasn't sure, like during COVID, we did like a rotating core. Like, yeah. Obviously, this is much, yeah. 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 But, Again, it's, it's amazing, it's amazing, amazing the amount of logistics <laughs> for potential five to six weeks. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you can answer this, but I'll, um, like, with different locations and stuff, um, I don't know, like, when the teacher would be, but, like, would driver's ed still be able to, like, get their in-school driving time in during that time, or? <laughs> yeah, so we've been, um, we, we've been, been <laughs> thinking a lot about driver's ed because there are really specific requirements in terms of, like, hours, and it has to occur somewhat synchronously because what you learn in the classroom, you have to be able to apply. Um, and so we, um, ha Paul Parsons, Mr. Parsons has a plan for how we'll move forward um, and you can apply to the state for a waiver if there's an exception in order to like extend your timeline. So I think that's part of what he's been talking about too. Yeah, it sounded like that was, um, it was going back and forth yep. and emails was getting the waiver in place. Yeah, and, and related to arts and other sort of more unique classes where where teachers may have a 7 through 12 curriculum we're meeting with some of those people um, to see if it might make sense to do a shorter period of time with a grade level on a location and more of a rotation or remote um, options so these things are on the table and as we solidify the places where students will be um, I think the plans will will fall into place. And again, everybody more. cross your fingers for December 5th. Yes. <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that's the big piece. Have um, you had a question? There was well, something else. We always talk to or you we can, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. yeah, there was something else I want to, uh, legislatively, since we, can, we got you here, we can bend, bend some years. Um, driver's Ed, there is no Driver's Ed prep program in the state of Vermont. Um, the last you mean a program that teaches the teachers how to, how to do it? So there, there is a shortage, incredible shortage. Um, we, we lucked out when we got Paul. We actually paid to send him over to Keene, uh, New Hampshire, to get his uh, credentials. Um, and then he took a lot of it on himself to also work with the department head, because you get the teaching credentials there to be able to teach the class. Then you got to work with um, the Department of Transportation, excuse me, to get the driving credentials. Um, we really need a program here. Um, drive, driver's Ed, especially in Vermont, um, when we've got 40 to 50 percent poverty in this district, the kids can't afford to spend 700 bucks to, to go and take that course in the driving piece. So it's just finding a focus, and I'm happy to come in and, and talk with folks if it helps about you know making sure that they at least get a training program in the state. To, to help these folks, because uh, we're, we're all going to be hurting pretty soon if, if we don't. 
Yeah. Yeah. If it looks like there's a legislative solution to that, you know, let's kind of, let's talk about that. Yeah. Happy to try and I mean, so, keep putting so in the spot. They're just they're generating really good ideas as we're, we're, we're talking. So. Um, yeah. Any any other? Nobody's trapped here, by the way. I usually just hang out until the questions peter out. <laughs> For the kids that are in the tech center, like my brother's a senior, so he probably has at least one or two classes that he would have to take at Randolph. How are you guys going to coordinate that? Is it the is it the math classes? Is it the? It'll probably be math or English. So the math and the English are going to actually get pushed into the programs, so he'll be able to take it that way. And RTCC um, is a different animal right now. Because of the size of the building, um, we were able to scour across the country. We've got uh, propane heating systems that, that if you drive by, you'll see them kind of around the outside of the building. We've literally kind of drilled holes in the windows and the walls to bring the heat in there. You at RTCC will be back in session on um, Monday following vacation. Um, you'll have some activities that are going on. I think there's a couple of field trips planned and some other activities for, yeah for next week, so yeah, you're, you're, you're on track. Uh, but no, uh, it's a very good question. Those courses will be pushed um, into the, the the regular program. The English teacher will literally come into the, you know, the automotive program and, and teach the English students and vice versa. So yeah, good question. So I think there was one more. I had a question. Yeah. Um, I, so I work in healthcare, but I was thinking about the workforce shortage. Has that impact on the district in the thinking about that or we've been okay as far as teachers it sounds like maintenance staff has been an issue uh, ma maintenance staff is, has been an issue um, paraprofessionals um, less less so um, a lot of it was was COVID related at the time um, because you know you had the, the, the staff are coming in to work in close contacts in a school with kids especially if you're a paraprofessional usually you're one so we have a lot of turnover, but you know, with some effort, we've been able to replace most, but not all. Um, we do have to get our starting salaries up. That's a, a big focus as, as part of the negotiation sessions that are happening right now to help that out. Um, Teacher-wise, uh, again, we've done we've done fairly well. Um, a lot of it is, is special ed substitute teachers are. No <laughs> We've had districts some that tried to you know, even double in their their substitute pay, and they still if they don't get more than they do, they just go like this. Again, um, I think I don't know why now, but I think at least during COVID, it was understandable people didn't want to come to the convention to make themselves at risk for getting a close to the But yeah, so the substitutes is a huge issue across the state. Yeah, what do you think is your question? Any others? Yeah, this sounds, sounds like we're winding down. I appreciate the turnout. I appreciate the work. I heard some really good conversations. Um, and so this will continue. Um, I will be meeting with the community in forums at least monthly. It's typically the third Thursday of every month. But if things come up, um, we'll meet more frequently. Um, so I do appreciate it. Be safe out there. There was a little snow falling. I don't think it was much, but it is cold. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.